excited to introduce our next speaker, also my friend and colleague, who I have just you know, finished a book with, and uh, Dr. Nuno. Not yet, not yet. Yeah, of course it is. In one month, I think. <laughs> um, no, no. I have time to You should be called a doctor already. <laughs> Dr. Nuno Bahadur Georgic, who is a teaching assistant at the, uh, in the Department of Culture, Film and Media at the University of Nottingham. And uh, Nunu has recently completed uh, his PhD thesis on Portuguese filmmaker Pedro Costa and has also uh, co edited a book uh, called Just Low Cinema with a certain uh, Tiago Stemita. <laughs> and uh, his uh, talk today is uh, entitled To Die a Thousand Deaths Historical Memory and the Representation of Personal Narratives in the Cinema of. Pedro Costa. Over to you, Nuno. Thank you very much, Tiago. Thank you very much also for the invitation. Um, I shouldn't wear my ears, but uh, yes, I would like to, uh, to thank the invitation. Um, I would like to start by arguing, arguing that the, uh, the work of Pedro Costa has, has come, to, come to convey uh, an evolving creative process in which personal recollection and historical context merge to offer a representation of post colonialism and, of course, related issues, uh, including immigration, urban displacement, and even social and uh, uh, economic development. Rooted more than specific cultural settings, cautious films are particularly, particularly and inherently related to individual trajectories uh, which share similar past and contemporary conditions. Feature films like, such as um, Casa de Lava from 1994, thank you, uh, Colossal Use from 2005, and more recently, Arts Money, which we will um, uh, look, uh, which we will show, uh, see today, uh, as well as several, several um, short films from 2007 onwards, uh, exemplify the condition of Cape Verdean characters whose representation negotiate between the individual and the collective, the subjective and the factual reality. <clears throat> Tying these films in narrative terms is the representation of what Costa once called the, the, a political dead chain, uh, a somehow subterraneous yet ever-present oppressive apparatus. Uh, sorry, subterraneous, subterraneous yet ever-present um, oppressive apparatuses and cause effect uh, mechanisms of history that have brutally shaped the lives of the of his films characters. However, uh, it needs to be pointed out that. Cautious films refuse, and perhaps always refuse, really, to engage in simplistic social and political commentary, and steer away from many documental uh, mechanisms uh, commonly present in, uh, in filmic representations of uh, historical event events. Um, instead, Cautious works cost constantly deal with um, ambiguous somatic and psychological presences and multiple uh, memory man manifestations assembled and a contemplative filmic style, uh, a form of rep representation commonly uh, understood as some sort of docu-fiction, uh, which came to mark uh, uh, most of his works, uh, at least the ones so soon after Casa de Lava. <clears throat> in order to explain how historical memory, I'll go into this in a second, uh, in order to explain how historical memory and the representation of personal narratives are depicted in the, in the, in the, in the cinema of Peter Costa, I would like to first expand a bit on this, this notion of the political dead shame, uh, which I've just mentioned. Uh, in a 1995 interview uh, given by Costa uh, uh, at, uh, I think it was at uh, uh, Publico, uh, uh, Portuguese newspaper, um, and in, in the context of the... the, the, uh, the, the, the um, the, the domestic release of Casa de Lava, his film from 1994, uh, Costa expressed concerns about how the oppression implicit in the lives of the, of the characters of this particular film um, have not just a direct correlation with, for example, the dictatorship uh, rule, and of course the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the colonial condition of Cape Verde, but also uh, relates with the democratic process that followed, of course, the, the 1974 revolution. And as Costa, Costa's arguing, and I, I'm quoting, uh, you just need to connect the cemetery crosses of the Tarrafal uh, prison camp uh, in, in, in Cape Verde to the hospital bed in Lisbon, uh, and we will look into, into, uh, into this hospital bed in a, in a second, 
um, as I was saying, into the hospital bed in Lisbon, to see, to see the chain that links dead in a concentration camp to the dead of Cape Verdeans falling from um, scaffoldings at construction sites uh, in Portugal. Uh, for me, and I, uh, I'm, I'm continuing to quote uh, Costa, uh, for me, it was the most accurate way to see Portugal. Um, I've discussed this notion of the dead chain elsewhere in, 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 another, in, another, in another article related particularly with representations of Cape Verdeans. Uh, but nevertheless, I would like to still engage with this idea of the, 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 the dead chain, the political dead chain. Uh, now, today, as a form of uh, or as a mechanism of presenting somehow an idea of the a negotiation between the past, or this, this notion of a continual, continual form of historical oppression, for example, um, which became so, so visible in post-colonial discourse. I think, for example, of, of, of course, uh, Spivak's understanding of imperialism, for example, a uh, term that manifests, in a, in a view, a continuous form of oppression surpassing uh, colonial, colonial historical past, also being displayed uh, into a kind of a new colonialism and uh, the international division of labor uh, in contemporary terms. So I would like to uh, look into this political dead chain, uh, but first of all, actually, I need to, to, do, to provide some kind of context to Casa de Lava, which was a film that uh, somehow originated uh, these comments that I just, uh, from Costa, that I just, uh, I just uh, 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 told you about. Uh, and the film, of course, it was filmed, as probably many of you, if not all of you, know, uh, it was filmed mostly in Cape Verde, um, and it was initially planned as an adaptation of, uh, of uh, Tornor, uh, a Jacques Tourneur classic, I Walk With a Zombie, from, from 43. Of course, continuing Carter's cinephilia affection so expressively uh, um, displayed in his uh, monochromatic first feature film, Blood, who, who sang from uh, 89. Um, However, <clears throat> cautious perception of the place, uh, a place of shooting, so the, the, the setting, and his increasing familiarity with the local participants uh, considerably changed the initial planned project. So soon, in, soon after the shooting started, the script was pretty much abandoned, uh, as far as I understood, giving way to a more documental representation, if I can put it that way, of the personal stories uh, of the non-professional actors that uh, Costa and, and the film, film crew uh, recruited on location. And the film plot concerns, uh, it was centered in a Portuguese nurse, Mariana, or of course in, in Asian Dutch, who takes some uh, comatose Cape Verdean construction worker, Leão, uh, played by, by, uh, by uh, Isaac de, de uh, Bacolet, uh, after an accident <coughs> at a construction site in Lisbon. Arriving in Cape Verde, Mariana tries to find Leon's family, a task that becomes considerably difficult considering that uh, the distance and reserved nature of the local residents towards her. Uh, though not explicitly, Pedro Costa introduces in the film, in this sort of plot, this sort of narrative, um, uh, narrative elements of somehow some, some, some sort of historical reality which are revealed through uh, details which evokes, for example, the memories of the Terrafal uh, prison camp, uh, <laughs> some human rights abuses per perpetrated by the colonial rule. <clears throat> um, this oppressive element remained visible in Costa's following films, of course, uh, Bones from 1997, in Wander's Room, um, of course, this discernible perhaps only in the lives of the people who are considered outside the limits of, some, of any homogeneous social context, uh, and re-emerges perhaps far more, well, surely far more visible in representations of the political, of, 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 of when his feature films, uh, Colossal Youth, so 2005, as I already said, and uh, again, Horse Money, as well as the different short films, uh, for example, Terra Fal, The Habitantes, both from 2007, uh, Sweet Exorcism from 2012, um, and this is a group of films that deploy uh, narrative processes that mediate between personal stories and recollections, and of course tensions between uh, tensions and crises of historical moments, positioning its characters sometimes simultaneously in different different chronological and physical spaces, either real or imaginary. Uh, establishing uh, establishing to some extent a narrative link with Casa de Lava, colossal youth depicts the personal story of Ventura, uh, not Ventura from Tabu. Uh, I think 
Kabul is based on exactly. Kabul. Actually, I'll, actually, what one of uh, so, so uh, is Santa? Santa also appears in Kabul, right? Oh, no, 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 not Santa Tila. Mm. I think. Tila. Uh, yes, oh, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. And again in uh, Thousand Years Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, as I was saying, establishing to some content, uh, to some extent, sorry, uh, a narrative link with with uh, Casa de Lava, Colossal Youth uh, depicts the personal story of Ventura, a former Cape Verdean uh, uh, construction worker who came to Lisbon as part of the workforce needed to build the city infra infrastructures or the new city infrastructures during the late 60s and early 70s, and who soon became handicapped uh, because of an accident in the construction site. So there is some kind of reflection on what we just, what I just told you about in, uh, from, from, from Casa de Lava. Uh, filmed at the former neighborhood, of course, of Fonteinhas, uh, as, as uh, you probably also know, um, uh, which also provide the setting of, of course, the two previous films, of course, Bones and Inventor's Room. Uh, room. Uh, and in, in the estate of Casal de Boba, uh, near Lisbon, uh, where some <coughs> of the Fonteinhas residents are being relocated. Uh, and Colossal Use presents this, these uh, Ventura's wanderings between the two different spaces, the, the two different locations, in a very peculiar way, I would say. <clears throat> so in the film, and I will look into space and time uh, now in, in, in Colossal Use. Uh, in the film, the depiction of Ventura's personal story is intertwined with a historical moment of the 25th of April uh, revolution and it's immediate aftermath. Um, as I point out by Costa himself, there are two parts in the film, one, and I'm quoting, sorry, uh, one which is put in the past, and the one, of course, in, 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 in the present, two parts which coincide with the, the before and with the before and after the 25th of April. Uh, this bio uh, end of quote. These biographic, biographical and historical facts are used as part of the narrative, reflecting the understated and often latent political contents of the film context. Uh, while opaque, the political theme underlying in the film impacts considerably on its narrative flow with numerous uh, flashbacks, not so clear or, or many of the, most of the times, constantly e exchanging between historical past and the present everyday lives of, his, of, his, of, of, the, of the film's characters. Uh, these subjective representations of Ventura's memories span uh, Spanish arrival with his friend Lento, played by Albert Bach, to Lisbon, and the uh, and the uh, immediate aftermath of the uh, 1974 revolution, tracing the ordeals and problems involved in adapting to the city, for example, of course the the art of you know the backbreaking work um, uh, that they are, they are both uh, subjected to, and, and and later in the film, into his accident at the construction site. Throughout the film, we see Ventura visiting several of his children, uh, many of them characters who also populated previously uh, in Venice Room, and uh, actually some also uh, Bones. Uh, it is understood that these characters are not, of course, Ventura's offspring or direct uh, family kin, but all of a community that once inhabits Fontainhas, which, uh, which, which started to be demolished in the late 90s. Um, as the film Portuguese title, Juventude Marches, so translated, roughly translated as Marching Youth, somehow bitterly and perhaps ironically points out this was a multicultural family habiting that space that once animated by potential promises of freedom tried to get out to, uh, to try to get out of the historical ties imposed by the political debt chain um, only to get stopped by the social inequity of the, the, the country's post-revolutionary post-revolutionary historical and economic process Towards the end of the film, the confusion caused by the events following the revolution is also made apparent, uh, contrasting with the commonly reported happiness and euph euphoria connected to the uh, revolution. Uh, these flashbacks show Ventura and Lento uh, barricaded, in, barricaded in their shack at Fontainhas, fearing possible violent acts inflicted on the migrant population. Uh, the narrative tra treatment of space and time in which historical context is dependent of subjective memory reenactment leads us to understand that colossal youth narratives presents, at least to some extent, a form of historical implotment. So some sort of a mixture between events that, while not, direct, <coughs> while not directly connected, can nevertheless be combined into a, some sort of narrative, some sort of narrative, li narrative line. In this case, tied of course, with the personal story of the of the film's character or characters, <coughs> um, and historiography in historiography, 
this term implotment has been deployed to characterize the process of contextualizing the meaning of historical narratives. Um, as Asman Muslim argues, in writing history, it is impossible, of course, to divorce the historian, the historian from the constitution of meaning through the creation of a context, even though this is seemingly and innocently derived from uh, the historical facts. As Maslow also argues, contemporary notions of historical narrative and representation are not so much tied to scientific protocols, uh, but have been considerably shaped by what, he, by what he calls a form of literary undertaking. So a system of storytelling relying on narrative subjectivity uh, and which takes in consideration not just factual uh, uh, evidence, but also the metaphorical and ideological strategies and language mechanisms used to narrate the historical past. <clears throat> um, the discussion of possible ambiguities of contemporary historiography is outside, of course, of the scope of this essay, uh, and as it is forms of narrative and representation. But nevertheless, this notion of implotment, either historical or not historical, uh, presented uh, by, by Munslow, uh, ties uh, factual and subjective evidence as an act of literary crea creation and provides some, some valid strategy to understand how filmic representations uh, can mediate between individual memory and external layers of reality <coughs> through a multifaceted, through a multifaceted narrative. And actually, I will probably I will have time to uh, give an example. For, uh, an example of this, of course, is for example the implotment in some of the narrative and representation strategy presented in um, earlier films from Strabo and uh, for example, particularly the chronic, Chronicle of Anna Madeleine Bach and history lessons, perhaps more evidently. Um, and as argued concerning these films, these are, of course, documents of documents. So just the positions of different times in the past, as uh, Gilberto Perez uh, uh, um, argues, concrete pieces of evidence that can be compared <coughs> with uh, one another in the present. In the, in the, discuss, the discussion of possible ambiguities of contemporary, sorry, I'm just repeating myself. Uh, yes, in this sense, Colossal Youth uh, presents a form of implotment that ties different pieces of evidence, factual, historical, idiosyncratic, subjective recalled, uh, subjective recalled uh, in order to present the multiple facets of historical time and its manifestations in personal stories. <clears throat> Once again, the perpetuity of the political action is manifested through this just this opposition, different times, uh, but also through uh, uh, the dialogue between the personal and the collective. Uh, furthermore, Costa's works mediate between different times, mediate between these different times by revealing a preoccupation of, of with depicting uh, doc documents. Uh, so he understood in, a, in the broad sense, and the table I'm, I'm presenting here somehow illustrates some of some of the uh, the, the artifacts, some of some of the, the evidence that Costa constantly uses in all his films, or most of his films. So we have somehow personal documents, official documents, uh, they are always <coughs> blend together somehow in most of the films. And I will um, look into that in a, in, in a bit. <clears throat> so these somehow contribute to some sort of contextual memory, I would say. That, of course, helps the, de the uh, narrative development. And, for example, an uh, example of this dialogue of juxtaposition of documents is presented, of course, in Casa de Lava in Colossal Youth. And we have here, for example, uh, uh, the personal letter constantly repeated by Ventura in uh, Colossal Youth, which, which, uh, which is adapted from a, a well-known letter poem uh, that Robert Dan there's no wrote to his lover soon after his arrest by the Nazis in 44, with a letter that firstly, a letter that firstly appears in uh, Casa de Lava, which is still from, uh, still from, uh, by, by Mariana. <coughs> and of course, another example of that, uh, it's a bit dark, I would say, but um, we probably can try to see it. I, th I, think, it's, I think it's readable, isn't it? Yes. Um, and again, uh, the recollect, for example, the recollections of Cape Verde depicted in, uh, in, in Terra Fal from 2007, and particularly the, the myth of the, this mythical creature uh, with, who uh, normally passes a letter uh, um, 
and comes to collect the lives of the, the, of the receiver of the letter soon after. Of course, again, alluding to this, uh, to course, the cinephile universe. Once again, we are dealing with a plot which is somehow similar to, uh, to Night of the Demon, uh, Tournel's symbols from, from 50, uh, 57, and which serves as a metaphor for both past repression and present oppression, I would say, um, understood by the official document depicted on your right at the end of the film. Uh, these mechanisms of, hist of historical employment are further pa patent in, uh, in Corsa's latest uh, feature film, Horse Money, uh, which we will, uh, of course, uh, watch later today. Uh, <clears throat> presenting similar temporal, temporal and spatial narrative folding as observed in Colossi Youth, uh, Horse Money can be seen as recalling or perhaps explaining further the narrative already present in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, the previous film. As a document of documents, Orsmani used different personal sources, <coughs> such as, again, once again, personal letters, oral recollection, songs, storytelling, and furthermore, official documents, bureaucratic questioning, uh, which provide further context into uh, Ventura's memory, which uh, is also a central, the central, one of the central characters in this film's narrative. Uh, and of course, his personal story, into his personal story, is further, further expanded by reenacting different decontinuous and multi-layered geographies of time and space, uh, occupying a timeless and perhaps imaginary present. This particular film depicts several moments in which, uh, we, which represent real and imaginary recollections of the past. For example, the, the moments of the April Revolution, or somehow related with, 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 with that, uh, with that um, um, event. Into his memories of his friend uh, Joaquin, uh, played by Tito Furtado, uh, the presence of Vitalina, Vitalina Varela, which is uh, played by Vitalina Varela, the wife of the, the, the of of, uh, of Joaquin, um, and who constantly whispers the contents of several uh, official documents that you will see today, uh, some kind of proofs of a, or a kind of official identity, somehow situated in the past which are mixed with the subjective memories being reenacted in uh, imag imaginary or uh, 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 real present. And as observed also in, in Colossal Youth, these suppositions are also extensive to space, not just time. And Orsmani depicts several moments in which different settings provide a multi-layered, uh, multi-facet, sorry, reading of the stories being represented. Uh, the space of the workshops and offices of the construction company where Ventura and some of his uh, acquaintances used to work. Space is tied, of course, to personal, to their personal stories, but also to somehow historical facts, or at least allude to some so sort of historical facts. Uh, illustrating further the multi-layered uh, geographies of time and space, the, of course, the hallucin uh, hallucinatory uh, um, uh, sequence um, Inside the lift, uh, um, in which Ventura and the figure of the of the soldier reenact several moments uh, related again with the revolution, which comes to consolidate a narrative employment that just opposes the poly uh, polygonal historical reading, <coughs> crossing different geographies of time and space, and of course mediating between individual memory and external layers, external layers of reality. To conclude, the cinema of, of Pedro Costa negotiates between personal and historical narratives and its continuous and multi-layered geographies of time and space in order to provide a form of employment, as I already uh, explained, that allows us to look into different factors shaping the life of these characters. Um, the mediation between historical fact and personal memory depicts throughout the words in the analyzed here. Uh, there is a written involving narrative employment that keeps adding particular facts in incremental, incremental form throughout different filmic te texts. It is never enough to, um, of course, to remember that we are looking at a filmic universe, a personal uh, filmic universe, that transcends several works, as of course does the, the political that chain that is normally uh, uh, represented in it. Um, Colossal Youth and Orsmani, while situating historically and to <coughs> some extent politically, these characters, I think we had this conversation last week, um, steer away a bit from, uh, steer away uh, clearly from the representations of the past, which can be commonly found in, for example, mainstream, mainstream historical drama, 
uh, so much from, 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 by what um, Ellison uh, Landsberg calls the prosthetic memory. Um, yet the narratives of these films allow us to perceive the historical context in the personal lives of these characters. I think it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's perceptible. Um, while not explicitly recreating historical moments, we nevertheless are invited to engage with the historical subterranean oppression which remains constant throughout different historical uh, 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 geographies, um, either from past, uh, either from, uh, from uh, chronological or from, from place. Um, tentatively, we could, of course, read cautious cinema as some sort of uh, cinema of resistance um, or a way of capturing the voice of the subaltern. Again, I'm, 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 I'm using uh, Spivak's term. Or to borrow the, a line from Ars Mani, a way of remembering the uh, the thousand deaths that these characters were able to endure, uh, and I, 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 once again I call for the addition of the scene of the, scene of the, the elevated lift, which is very very compelling on that. Uh, but perhaps more conclusively, however, these films pre present moments of reach uh, in which the porous borders between subjective narrative and historical facts are revealed, resisting the loss uh, the loss of another memory. Uh, either collective or, or, or personal, that the hegemonic processes of official history still perhaps struggle to uh, document. Uh, thank you. I'm delighted to introduce our final speaker yes, in this session, Teresa Castro. Uh, Teresa studied art history doctor Teresa Castro, who studied art history in uh, Lisbon and London before completing a PhD in film studies at uh, Sorbonne in Paris. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the Musée du Guayne Bonny. Is that correct? And she has been an associate professor in film studies and image theory at uh, Sorbonne since uh, 2011. She's also the author of a book in French, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, La, la, la Pensée Cartographique des, des, im des Images, <laughs> which I think should be translated in English. The bits that I have seen from it are quite uh, brilliant. And her uh, talk today is entitled uh, The After Woodness of the Colonial Image Artists, Researchers, and the Portuguese Colonial Archive. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the kind presentation and uh, thank you to Leo Scan for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've done uh, a lot of work on um, photographic colonial images and some ethnographic films, historical films, and I don't usually work, well, when it comes to colonial, post-colonial questions, I don't usually work on contemporary material but I'm going to be talking about contemporary material today, so let's see if you um, if you agree with some of my of my readings. And so, what interests me is um, the way that in recent years a growing number of Portuguese artists and filmmakers have been undertaking what can be described as a more or less detailed exploration of some very specific aspects of Portugal's recent colonial past. A few of these films, such as Filipe Cesar's The Embassy and Andreia Sobreira's Ani Mozambique, a film that, uh, um, that was already mentioned today, <coughs> focus on photographic albums relating to the colonial period, while others, such as Manuel Maia's Ariava film, delve into personal filmic archives. Other films, such as Some Man, <coughs> No Man's Land, choose instead to ignore historical documents and archi ar archival footage and to concentrate instead on the testimonial stance of a character, here an ancient mercenary. A Flemish film is rather unique. Very few Portuguese films have been so exclusively and rigorously built around the problem of bearing witness Speech and oral testimony play an, an essential role in all of the films that I've mentioned so far. As a matter of fact, there's but one notable exception among the rather subjective constellation of films that I will discuss today. Daniel Barocas playing with, <laughs> playing with Dead Lizard. There's no soundtrack and no, no voice. 
Despite their different strategies and results, all these films seem symptomatic of a peculiar situation concerning both the memory and the history of Portugal's recent colonial past, and with it, the memory and the history of that deeply traumatic event, which was the Long Liberation War opposing between 1961 and 1974, the oldest Western European dictatorship to its African colonies, Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau, the islands of Cape Verde and São Tomé having been sparked fighting on their territories. Neglected for a long time by the national collective memory and confined to some well-known, albeit exceptional, literary and cinematographic examples, these events have slowly been returning to the public eye in Portugal. A documentary series uh, in 42 episodes entitled A Guerra, The War, produced by the National Television Company and distributed between 2007 and 2013, was not only an opportunity to rediscover and to discover rarely, rarely seen or unknown archival images, but also a way to give voice to a multitude of witnesses and actors coming from different sectors of Portuguese and African politics. In many ways, it's as if the Portuguese had almost unwillingly entered their own particular era of testimony, or at least a, of witness. Uh, expressions that have been used by historians Shoshana Feldman and Annette Vieviorca in order to discuss the particular problems posed by the role of, the role of survivor testimonies and second-hand witnesses in Holocaust remembrance and representation. This would be a very complex issue to, well, we wouldn't have the time to discuss this in detail today. Uh, I'm not saying that the, that the situation is the same, but I'm saying that the work that they've done on this problem of witnessing, of bearing witness, and, on the screen in particular, particular would be uh, uh, relevant maybe to think what's going on in terms of, uh, of the Portuguese uh, visual, uh, visual landscape. So the war series has been the source of many debates, on what, many debates on what the Portuguese still call the colonial war and on the different civil wars that ensued. As a matter of fact, a guerra illustrates, perhaps better than any other filmic, photographic or literary examples, an important memo memorial turn, a sort of return of the repressed, or un unblocking, débrocage, through which the recent Portuguese colonial history is gradually becoming a distant past, therefore more likely <coughs> to be named, discussed and studied as such. The rediscovery of Portuguese colonial cinema, to which we have to thank, among others, our, ho our host and friend, Maria do Carmo Pissarra, as well as the rediscovery of films made by and for the different African liberation movement movements during the war itself, is also underway. Significantly, but perhaps not surprisingly, this unblocking is very often based on the more or less violent confrontation with images whose location is the archive. The archive, first and foremost, has the nomological arche, which, to quote Derrida, <laughs> names at once the commencement and the commandment, uh, what is called in French l'archive, um, in a masculine singular. Uh, but the, arch the, the archive also has the place where historical materials are produced and not simply stored, what in French is called des archives, fe uh, feminine plural. I'm sorry, sometimes the French and the English is complicated. Uh, if many literary works confirm this memorial turn, moving images are also concerned by these transformations. Significantly, a growing number of films made by artists, filmmakers, authors whose works linger on the institutional borders between film and contemporary art, have been engaging in rigorous and inventive documentary explorations, retrieving forgotten archives such as pe personal or family archives, but not, no, not only gathering testimonials and questioning the blank spots in the official accounts. It's possible that the very location of these works, the increasingly blurred image regimes of cinema and art, is an, an important criterion to understand their strategies and challenges. Nonetheless, what we're interested in today is, on the one hand, the figure of the research artist and, in particular, the artist as historian, 
and, on the other hand, the way in which their films allow us to better understand the mnemonic processes at stake within this memorial turn, and the way that they negotiate a progressive historicization of memory. As I will argue at the end of my presentation, the Freudian notion of afterwardness seems to be important within this context. So some elements on the artist as researcher. So it's not a very original idea, uh, because uh, the notion of the artist as uh, historian, the artist as ethnographer, or even the artist as archivist, uh, has been already discussed by a number of authors that I will recall very briefly. One of the defining characteristics of contemporary art seems to be the way it has been increasingly concerned with the relationship between history and memory, as well as with the archive as a complex repository of documents and records. Uh, American art historian um, Al Foster wrote an important essay on the artist as ethnographer, where he discussed the emergence in the 1990s of this new character whose paradigm was now anthropology, understood as a science both of otherness and culture. In a different text, um, sorry, uh, in a different text, um, the same Foster looked instead at another contemporary phenomenon, that of the artist as archivists, whose interve interventions in the archive constitute gestures of alternative knowledge or counter-memory. Even though the works that I would like to discuss potentially share a number of traits with the phenomenon that uh, Foster describes, what strikes me is their closeness to a specifically historian approach. Drawing on Hayden White, Mark <coughs> Godfrey has discussed and theorized what he calls the artist as historian, arguing that recent art is not simply characterized by the centrality of the, of the archival gesture, but also of historical research per se. In this context, and if, instead of drawing on white, I would like to, re to recall what French historian and philosopher Michel de Certeau says about the practice of history in his classical work, The Writing of History. In this remarkable book, de Certeau discusses the different techniques and economies of, of historical writing, defending that, and I quote him, writing is not a neutral technique, but a way of organizing social space, instituting hierarchies, and prescribing relations. In other words, the writing of history is a narrative that recounts and interprets events, challenging the historian to, think, to rethink this very notion. So I'm going to talk a little bit of, about the notion of event that was already evoked by Lucia. So commenting on the May 68 events that shook Paris, events that he understood to be genuine, genuinely new and in many ways unthinkable before they happened, De Certeau famously wrote, and I quote him, that an event is not what, it, what can be seen or know about it, but what it, what it becomes and above all for us. Such an understanding of the notion of historical event calls for a new approach to historical and cultural analysis, an approach that acknowledges both the active role of, his, of the historian and the fundamental otherness of the past. The films and artistic works that I'm going to discuss today certainly do not substitute themselves to the work of a well-delimited scientific community. The strategies that they mobilize and develop, the meaning effects that they explore and that they generate are not necessarily the same as those used and highlighted by the institu institutionalized discourses of professional historians. Nevertheless, the artists and filmmakers that have, that have made them face perhaps similar problems. The production of documents, a new understanding of what a historical event is, as well as the uncanny otherness of the past, all three in the sense of de Certeau's readings. Attesting a relationship to the present marked by a sense of urgency, these artists are often faced with documents and the archive, reenacting what de Certeau describes as the gesture of setting aside of putting together, of transforming certain objects into documents. Moreover, they also examine the way that these events were and are narrated or ignored, addressing the representations of historical realities and or questioning, for instance, their mediality. So I'm going to move on to a few examples. 
The point of departure of many artists and filmmakers interested in the Portuguese colonial past are often individual or family memories, which is a way of privilege, privileging the relationship to the lived, experienced, and of evoking the, the notion of event, sorry, already mentioned. This is the case with Manuel Sancho Maia, who since 1999 has been developing a vast artistic project entitled Aliava, translated by the artist himself as alienated, imperfect past tense of the verb to alienate, referring us to the past, defines the action or the consequence of deviating, withdraws, <coughs> transfers, conveys to someone else, and in any of this, these circumstances also denounces a number of psychological meanings such as to live in an abstract world, to turn away from something, and strange, distracted, forgotten, who lost his mind. The multiple meanings of Aliava allow the artist to explore and to expose what he defines as the Portuguese difficulty with its colonial past and its post-colonial condition. Based on the collection of objects and the production of documents, the Aliava project includes installations, performances, photographs and films. Born in Mozambique to Portuguese parents, Maia re returned to Portugal with his family after the independence. The project Aliava specifically focuses on his family's special status, a family of retornados or returnees, the hundreds of thousands of Portuguese people residing in the colonies and who returned to Portugal at the end of the war as destitute refugees, and who suddenly finds itself exiled in their country of origin, torn between the nostalgia for their effective nation, Mozambique, and the memories of the war, both the Liberation War and the Civil War that torn Mozambique after the independence. Maya's project includes a filmic component entitled A Yava Film, in which the artist reuses Super 8 films shot by his family and collects his father's testimony. That's his father on the screen. The lecture does not comment on the images that we see. Maya recorded his testimony during several sessions, asking him to recall the war years those before and those after the independence. The film draws on the meaning, meaningful <coughs> conflict between the man's oral testimony and the images that we see filmed during the colonial occupation, while focusing on the operating mode or malfunctioning of memory. The very body of the film, made of images more or less deteriorated by time, marked by discontinuities, jumps and distortions, constitutes a formal allegory of memory itself. In this sense, the fact that we are dealing with Super 8 film, an outdated, obsolete medium, is obviously significant. Despite its domestic private origins, a Yava film by no, mean, by no means attempts to create a coherent narrative of the past, such as a family memory, a family history. On the contrary, the film acknowledges its lacks and omissions. The film draws explicitly on the question of memory, in particular an identitary memory, that of the retournage, and a traumatic memory. Maya's father admits in the film that he is afraid to say certain things. If, as Michel de Certeau writes, the historical study bring to the stage the work of memory, I would like to argue that Maya's project does something similar. Despite its reliance on the oral testimony, Maya's film is not motivated by the urgency to bear witness, unlike Salome Lama's No Man's Land, but by the desire to expose the ambiguous and sometimes contradictory operations of memory. In some ways, the father's commentary appears as an act of mourning, and, an well, and I recall, I'm going to recall what mourning means in um, psychoanalytic terms. Uh, it's an important uh, intrapsychic process occur occurring after the loss of a loved object and whereby the subject, the subject gradually manages to detach himself from this object. And this, this idea of detachment is, is important. Uh, so this detachment is essential since it hints at this complex, painful passage from memory to history. Despite its reliance on the family's private archives, the film transforms what constitutes a personal singular memory into an embodiment of collective memory. It's in this sense that Maya's film, as well as his global project, seems to be symptomatic of the memorial turn that I mentioned before. Moreover, Maya's film also reveals the paradoxical <coughs> psychic temporality at stake in the mnemonic, in the mnemonic process. 
the afterwardness or retrospective logic that characterizes the process of reorganization and re-registration of traumatic events, what Freud called in an untranslatable German world the <coughs> word the Nachträglichkeit. In other words, trauma, be it the trauma of war or the trauma of loss, can only be understood retrospectively. So some of these problems are also present in both Philippa Cesar's The Embassy and Andrea Subreira's I'm in Mozambique. The first was shot in Bissau and focuses on one of the rare photographic albums from the colonial period that can still be found in the ravaged ar archives of the Guinean capital. The spectator knows nothing about this album, when it was assembled and by whom. The artist came across it by chance during a research trip made in the context of a larger project on revolutionary Guinean filmmakers related to Emil Cabral. The film's title is an allusion to the homonymous film by Chris Marquer, Embassy, as well as a tribute to the work, to the work that a French filmmaker carried out in Guinea-Bissau. This reference is obviously important. Shot with a Super 8 camera, Embassy by Marker, appeared to its viewer as a true archival record. This is not a film, playing the voiceover, these are notes taken day after day, the camera has become witness. I'm quoting the Mar Marcus film. Describing the situation of a small group of political activists who take refuge in a diplomatic building. If the film evokes the Chilean events of September 1973, there are no temporal or geographical coordinates, and it's only at the end of the film that the viewer understands that he is dealing with a fable, since the military coup and the establishment of a fascist regime actually takes place in Paris. Fiction triumphs over the document, not without delivering a diagnostic on the present linked here to the anxieties of the military French left in 1973. Caesar's film is based on a simple but extremely effective device. The artist filmed the album in one single long static shot, choosing a high, a high angle. Caesar asked the Guinean journalist and archivist Herman Lona to flip its pages and to comment on them. We only see the hands of Lona. They live through the album, sometimes indicated, indicating the images that attract his attention. Arranged in a strict orthogonal grid, with perf which perfectly illustrates the oppressive rationality of the colonial re system, the individual photographic prints in the album are relegated to the film's background. What comes to the spectator's attention are not a thousand details um, that these images certainly hid, but their overall effect, the way in which they were carefully disposed and catalogued. We're not able to, to read the handwritten captions under the pictures. What matters is Lona's commentary. A significant dislocation is therefore operated. The dominant discourse of colonial power embodied here in and by a photographic album whose careful composition is a perfect example of colonialism's desire to control and organize is replaced by the observations of the former colonized, Lona incarnating that other of speech constantly silenced during the colonial period. This gesture exposes the multiple rich layers hid behind the, the album's apparent transparency. Ultimately, and much in the manner of Marker, it's the document itself that is exposed as a colonial fable. The film does this by instituting the word of the, of the, of the discursive other, and with it the present, as a const constitutive element of the past. So, at first glance, the embassy shares many formal elements with Andrei Subreira's film, I Am in Mozambique. <coughs> the film also draws on a photographic album made this time by a former colonial soldier who fought in the Portuguese army between 1971 and 1974. Uh, Some of the images that we see in the film are also slides, it's not only a photographic album. Andrea Subreira, whose film was part of her final project in a Portuguese art school, asked the former, former soldier to comment on the images he brought from Mozambique. As in Cesar's film, we will never see this narrator. We only catch a glimpse of his hands at the beginning of the film when he writes on a notepad that the film that we are about to see is but, I quote, a chronic or narrative of certain events based on the observation of all these photographs, both in color and black and white. 
And like Cesar, Sobreira chooses to isolate the photographic images in her film, to each photograph corresponding at least one steady shot. It's only towards the end of the film that some of the album's plates are revealed to the spectator. This revelation comes as a shock, as some of the album's plates are revealed, I'm oh, sorry, this revelation comes as a shock, as illustrated by a plate bringing together pinup photographs and images of crashed airplanes. Unlike Cesar, Sobreira doesn't give the word to the former oppressed, but to the former oppressor, the soldier who incarnates the colonial power. Even if the photographic images occupy the screen, the living voice of their commentator quickly becomes the film's focal point. This voice doesn't strike the spectator, at least the spectator fluent in Portuguese, as the disembodied authoritative voice that, is, that distinguishes the voiceovers of so many colonial films, in particular non-fiction films. Marked among others by a strong regional accent, this voice strongly suggests to the viewer a number of elements concerning the man's social background, cultural level, etc. Overwhelmed by a pseudo-scientific desire for accuracy, the former radio operator embarks on a detailed description of the technical means and weapons that the Portuguese army had at its disposal, using its personal photographs as evidence. More than a commentator, he sounds like a, spokes a spokesman repeating his speech learned by heart. But his distance discourse is gradually disturbed by multiple linguistic accidents, ranging from the progressive difficulty to formulate gram grammatically correct sentences to the embarrassment of not finding the right words to describe the mortal victims of war or his enemies at the time. These are sometimes referred to by derogatory terms or instead by official expressions <coughs> coined during the colonial era. Other times he uses more recent politically correct terms and he even invents his own terms such as people of African expression which doesn't exist, obviously. What begins as a particularly fast speech starts to slow down and to be progressively punctuated by longer hesitations. The spectator wonders if the verbal frenzy of the beginning, as well as the numerous photographs of weapons and technical equipment, I think I've got one here, um, so we wonder if these images were but screen memories standing in for a more disturbing or painful memories whose present revisiting invests them with a new <coughs> traumatic significance. This is particularly evident when the former radio operator is confronted with a picture of a helicopter transporting coffins or with a photograph of young African prostitutes. In this way, the film seizes in a rather brutal manner the way in which the psyche rearranges events after they happened recalling their Freud, Freud's uh, retroactive theory and his notion of uh, afterwards. Um, Freud first introduced this difficult, difficultly translatable term in 1896, uh, the notion referring to the way in which a past event becomes traumatic after the present transforms or remolds it as traumatic. In other words, for the past to have an impact on the present, the present firstly needs to resonate in the past. This is how a simple <coughs> memory image becomes a trauma charged with pathogenic force. As Laura Mulvey has pointed out in an insightful discussion on the colonial compilation film, I'll show you just another <coughs> image for the moment. And I'm about to <coughs> So as Laura Mulvey has pointed out in an insightful discussion on the colonial compilation film, the latter uh, has the unique ability to bear witness to the past, to render the message visible, and to carry forward its demand, responding to Freud's retroactive theory in as much as the revision of the original archival footage that represented the colonial vision reveals something deposited in within it that demands to be exposed. If none of the examples that I've discussed so far is a compilation film, not even a, a Yava film, Mulvey's insights still seem pertinent. Moreover, all these films bring to the fore the questions of indexicality and latency in the imaging. Indexical images, such, such as photographs and film, are impregnated with memory, their past existence shining like an aura in the present. They bring the past to the present, but what they make visible changes over time. Despite their transparency, 
they are a question of visibility and invisibility. What we see today from our tempor temporally dislocated point of view is never what we will see tomorrow and afterwards. So in with regards to this, uh, Daniel Barroca's installation, Soldier <coughs> Train, the Dead Lizard, is to me uh, particularly significant. Revolving around a small photograph showing a Portuguese soldier playing with a dead lizard, the work focuses on the image's details as if looking for something hidden within the image. As Barroca enlarges and decomposes the photograph, a bit like David Bailey in Blow Up, the representation breaks down and with it the myth of transparency around the indexical image. How can we think, in any case, about the violent images exposed by Andrea Sobreira, so far confined to their private domestic domain and whose status is not clear? And we're going to hear Danielle talk in a little bit, uh, and also the, the, one of the works that Maria do Carmo showed this morning uh, illustrates the violence of some of these familiar images forgotten in familiar uh, family <coughs> albums. So I think we will have the chance to return to this. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the status of these images is a little unclear. Are they archival images? The photographic album compilating the war memories is a relatively common object among many Portuguese families. It belongs to a, to a widespread but almost completely ignored historical genre. Upon their arrival in Africa, many Portuguese soldiers bought what was often their first camera. Photographic material was then more easily, easily accessible in the, in the colonies than in Portugal, and the arrival in the exotic African landscapes apparently stimulated their imagination. Many of them, like José Sobreira, the radio operator of Miami, Mozambique, were leaving for the first time in their lives the small villages of a country isolated from the world. Africa was, for them, at least upon arrival, and before it became the scenario of a bloody war, a place of adventure. Landscapes, pictures of exotic animals and plants, as well as pseudo-ethnographic photographs, focusing, focusing essentially on topless native women, coexist with images of the war, strictly controlled by the army and the political police, which also monitor the development of the films in the metropolis. Again, it's only after these strange mementos of war and travel were made that they become traumatic to the individual and undoubtedly significant to the collective. In other words, these images become significant retroactively. It's at this stage that they can re-enter history and participate in its rereadings. It's at this stage also that they enter the Portuguese colonial archive, understood in a very, obviously, in a very large way. <coughs> Exhibiting once again the wounded character of memory, Andrea Sobreira's film, <coughs> who is indeed the daughter of the formal soldier, exposes the sometimes tr transformation, the sometimes very painful transformation of an image into a historical document. Despite its flaws, the film is therefore absolutely symptomatic of the in-between, in-between memory and history, in-between be remembrance and trauma, in, in which dwell several Portuguese artists today. Thank you. Sorry for that.